first I must uh, explain that uh, I am not an academic. I am an engineer. And therefore, I will not attempt to make uh, assertions that are based on fact. Uh, they will be uh, claims that I make, and I invite everybody to uh, test those claims against real life, because <clears throat> in engineering, you always work with imperfect tools and inadequate information, and you must therefore uh, produce a result that will serve the necessary function. And that's uh, always a matter of guesswork. So I ask you to uh, judge me and my, my assertions here on this basis. Now, we see here a picture that I call the origin point for the social internet. 64 is taken against the rules by myself in the uh, office of the uh, free speech movement in Berkeley. Now this doesn't look very computerized, it isn't. There's no computers in those days. There's just telephones. And uh, it doesn't look very neat. It doesn't look very efficient. But in this inefficiency, uh, a, an outcome was developed, I think, that is still redounding today. We see people busy listening to phones. There are only two telephones. And the items on the wall constitute the database, which was constantly changing as people called in. Now, a telephone room in a well-run company will have a good order and information will come in, it will be recorded, it will be categorized, it will be passed up to the necessary people, people information to go out will come in and it will be a flow of information going both ways, all very orderly because the uh, functioning of the business would uh, rely upon that. That's not happening here. People are calling in for various reasons. Uh, sometimes they have information they wanted to pass on. Sometimes they have a question they wanted answered. Sometimes they wanted to offer a resource. I think in one of these notices, I don't believe it's readable on this screen, uh, someone is offering haircuts for free because we were coming up on the time when the, the holidays would have people going home to face their parents, and often they would need a haircut. Uh, so and, that, and they also named it Haircut Central. We sort of have a approach of naming everything Central and Central. So this was within FSM Central. And so all, all manner of connections are being made through this set of phones and this desk and these people. Uh, and you may well imagine that you can't just put any people in there. The information is in part in the heads of the people as well as on the walls. Now, the reason why this is important, uh, it, both for the immediate situation in 1964 and for the future, is that it was a part of a mechanism uh, that allowed the campus community to form. Now, Berkeley is a big place. At, in those days, it was 20,000 students. Today, it's 30,000. Uh, and it was notorious for uh, alienation. You came there, you were all alone within a massive crowd. You didn't know anybody, they didn't know you, and they didn't care. Now, when I got there, I actually liked that situation, but I'm a special case. Um, the contrary to what we heard from uh, the professor from Italy yesterday, uh, the issue that the free speech movement formed around was the suppression by the administration of the university of the ability of students to organize uh, to support the civil rights movement, which at that time was extending into the north. And in fact, 
1964 was the particular year because in the summer of 1964, the Freedom Summer Project had attracted students from all over the country to get a taste of the terrorism that was prevalent in Mississippi and Alabama. And then they returned. A few didn't. Uh, and it was as if these were veterans coming back from combat. Uh, I remember the feeling well. That not, not that I was feeling it, they were, and you could tell that. And at that time, the university issued a new rule. There were tables that these student groups had set up just outside of campus. It was a wall of posts on the sidewalk. And thousands of people would stream past on the way in and out of the campus. And they, they could get information at these tables. They could give donations. They could sign up for participation uh, and uh, in various things, including uh, demonstrators in the uh, galleries of the uh, Republican National Convention that was held in San Francisco that year. And of course, the, that was the contention between the first of the, in effect, the MAGAs, Barry Goldwater, and some moderate guy named Scranton. And the local political boss was on the side of the MAGAs, and he was not uh, amused by students being recruited at these tables to come over to uh, the San Francisco to the convention and make noise against his candidate. And so we understand, we don't have this in literal proof, uh, that he put pressure and others put pressure on the administration because there were also protests underway uh, for, uh, to remedy housing discrimination, oh, not housing, but pr uh, employment discrimination and uh, there were sit-ins. It was rather disorderly at times. So the university was receiving pressure from outside. They issued this rule. And it was a, a completely the wrong time to do it because again, civil rights was not a distant matter. It was not just in the South. It had come right into our front yard. And the students who came back from Freedom Summer were heavily involved. So all of the student organizations, from the far left to the, to the far right, from the, uh, the Maoist Progressive Labor, Labor Party to the Libertarian, uh, what was it, Society of Individualists, something like that. They were to the right of the, the campus uh, Young Republicans, or the Cal Conservatives for Political Action. They all united as a united front to face this and to fight it. And since the university had discovered that they actually owned the land on that sidewalk strip out to much closer to the curb, we couldn't move the tables out, so the tables had to go into campus. And we engaged in classical civil disobedience, uh, a strategy known as filling the jails. The, uh, we set up tables, let's see, next. Let's go, I've already discussed this. The, uh, we set up tables right in front of the administration building. If it's gonna be illegal to have it anywhere on campus, that's as good a place as any. And deans would come out and take names of students for disciplinary purposes. As soon as they took one person's name, another one would take their place, take my name too. And eventually in that day, uh, when they were summoned to the dean's office, 150 students showed up. You know, punish us. They weren't able to do that. The next day, yes, October, no, this was October 2nd, 1964. The next day, uh, excuse me, I'm wrong. This was September 30th. So October 1st, the, the protest continued and the first non-student was cited. And this was like, uh, a gleeful opportunity for the university because a law had been passed in the last year that provided criminal penalties for anybody being on campus without being a registered student or faculty member. We got one. So they did the most stupid thing possible. In the middle of the day, shortly before the vast torrent of people were to come past, they brought up a police car and they put this person, Jack Weinberg, in the police car 
and what can you expect? Everybody started to sit down and the police car was captured. And this grew and grew and lasted for 32 hours. Eventually there were negotiations, there was some kind of arrangement made. We went on it for two months until finally there was a climac climactic sit-in at the uh, in the university building, I was involved as uh, 784 students were arrested. Uh, the faculty was shocked into uh, recognizing the situation and uh, in a few days they voted in their faculty senate by a factor of 80% to support the student position. This provided the political support for the, to cause the, the owners of the university, the regents to back off and say, well, we're not going to interfere with this. So suddenly, the campus became open to any and all kinds of student activity, whether or not it was approved by the university. Prior to that point, you couldn't hand out a leaflet on campus unless it was approved. Now you could hand out anything you wanted. Uh, I'm going to talk here about media structure because this got me thinking about it. I mean, that was, I don't mean it got me thinking about it right now. I mean, it got me thinking about it in 1964. I was an engineering student. Um, I adhered to the opinion, sort of vaguely left-wing opinion, that my future task would be automation and replacing labor, and that would somehow advance social progress. And I had uh, tried to attach myself to the uh, FSM office because I didn't have any classes or homework. I was working on campus for that six month period. And uh, my quest was to find out what I could do as a technologist because that's all I thought I could do. I was not not going to change anybody's mind, but I could build things. And I, had, I will talk at a later time about what happened there, but the result was that I went off in a, on, a, on a path of exploration, trying to find what, especially what media technologies would be effective. Now, the reason to this is that when the, December was the, uh, the last, month of the academic year, January of 1965, the, the campus was amazing. All sorts of people were doing all sorts of things uh, in all sorts of fields. Uh, this we didn't expect. This was the opening of the counterculture, certainly in the Bay Area. There have been countercultures in the past, but the one we consider here is the uh, counterculture of the 1960s. And um, I wrote some little essay which somebody published. Uh, and of course, this is not what young engineering students do. We usually keep our mouths shut. Um, but people weren't keeping their mouths shut and they weren't staying in one place. In fact, we can estimate that some thousands of students dropped out, left the university and turned up later in places like the Haight-Ashbury. They formed their own communities. And that was the key to it all. Um, I want to look here, uh, go back to looking at the media structure. What I came up with around that time and shortly thereafter was an, anal an analysis of media into two categories, broadcast and non-broadcast. Broadcast media emits the same message from one to many. Now this can be on print, doesn't have to be in electromagnetic. And it can be done from noon rallies. We had noon rallies almost every day. Thousands of people would listen to what's going on about the particular, about the crisis at the particular moment. We handed out leaflets. I helped produce those leaflets. That's the one thing I did, was able to do. And uh, people would come to the campus in the morning to uh, take the leaflets we had turned out. And they would go out and they were risking discipline by doing so, and people knew that. And so they, each of them became a focal point for discussion. People would come up to them and say, well, why are you doing this? What's up? What's going on? What do you think? Uh, 
<clears throat> we also had a subscriber-owned radio station in Berkeley, which I think advanced the entire process because we had a kind of feedback loop. It was possible to get information on into that station. It was non-commercial and run by people mostly like us. The non-broadcast medium were the discussions happening around the uh, leafleteers. Uh, we also created an organizational structure with a large executive committee that really wasn't executive, but it had representatives from all living uh, organizations and others. And this formed as it, it provided a two-way information conduit. These people were involved in setting the policy. Uh, and there was a steering committee that they elected, uh, which handled the moment-to-moment -moment, uh, decisions. And, and there, some of those members of the steering committee were, in fact, replaced during the struggle, which is a little unusual among revolutionary organizations. But we had this path going out to all these people that there were the constituents. We also had people who worked in the uh, uh, student recreation uh, center and the art uh, studios. And they would, be, they would carry on discussion there. So we also had the telephone system and the information exchange on that. That counts as a non-broadcast medium. So we look at the telephone, the symmetric, universally accessible, at least in where we were. And I've already discussed the questions, suggestions, offer of resources. And what the process was, I call cross-connection. Now that is an actual telephone technology term. Everything in the phone, then the phone system is neat, neat, neat until it comes up to the point where everything has to be cross-connected from one set of wires to the other. That's a mess. There's almost no way to do that that's neat. So the w notes on the wall, that was a mess, but it was the cross-connection. And what happened here, the, you couldn't talk the, you couldn't uh, go through the, the substantive discussions on the phone like that, on the phone room. They would have to cut it short. So you can divide the information into two forms, primary and secondary. Primary information is the, the content that you need to convey, the lecture, the whole story. Secondary information is who they need to contact and how to contact them in order to get that whole story. And so the telephone room was uh, exchanging secondary information and uh, and this worked. I mentioned that we succeeded at our goals uh, from the objective standpoint, and then we had the magic of January 1965. Some students started a, an outrageous new magazine, a precursor to Rolling Stone, uh, and advertised it with a gigantic spider mobile hanging over their table. Well, they had to take that mobile down. We agreed that it was okay to have regulations on you know, t time, place, and manner. But our position had been, in reference to the U.S. Constitution, first and 14th or fight. First Amendment and a 14th Amendment. I can explain that in legalistic terms later. It's not worth doing now. But when you have a nice slogan like that, you've got something. Um, I mentioned how people were changing the direction of their lives. I was too. And it was a magical feeling. I wanted life to be like that all the time. And so, oops, uh, resolved to find the technological tools to make the process regular. Rational. But it's a whole lifetime's worth of work, as I found out. So. The telephone information exchanges continued within the counterculture. They were called switchboards. That's not the proper telephone terminology, but it's, who cares? And by 1969, there was a listing of all of them for all the various causes and uh, whenever, you know, gay lib turned up, they had a switchboard. Call them and you're in contact with them. Uh, the underground press that I just mentioned. Uh, 
started in 1965 to report upon the uh, anti-war demonstrations because the Vietnam War was heating up that year. So uh, the anti-war activity followed and was made possible by the free speech movement. It's now called the under alternative press and it continues. There's no ending date on it. But these are little papers put out of houses and little offices. Um, and I believe they could be a community uh, media. So I went into them. I, I worked in there as a writer. I learned journalism there. And I also saw what happened by, by the very structure of the media. They became uh, loaded up with ads, personal ads, sex ads, and then display ads for sex matters. They made a lot of money for the publisher, but they were not community media anymore. Um, and so I learned. The subscriber-owned radio station, KPFA, established in 1949 by pacifist anti-war objectors who had been imprisoned and, and otherwise had to do government service during the war, and they decided the media needs to change and we'll set up a station that our listeners will own. Up on the FM band, the frequency modulation band, was just opening up at that time, so there were no listeners. They had to make their own listeners. They had to build their own radio set and offer it to subscribers, and they did. And computer students began a project to, to uh, bring the power of computers to the counterculture. And this is important because that's where my path leads me. They formed an organization. They actually took over a corporate shell from a uh, switchboard, a San Francisco switchboard, which was going dormant, and set it up as Resource One in 1970. And I heard about them just about the same time that I had reached the conclusion on my own that what I was looking for was a network of computers. And this in 1970, you couldn't run out and buy that. <laughs> that was a big deal. And I remember saying, well, where am I going to get a computer? One year later, I was in that group, Resource One. They had secured uh, the long-term loan, which is in effect the donation of not only a good mainframe computer, but the very same computer that had been used by Douglas Engelbart in 1968 for what is called the mother of all demos, where he demonstrated the personal use of computers, the big mainframe computer, but this was a bit of a genius bit of work. And uh, that, when I heard about that demo demonstration, I changed my thinking about what computers could do and how they could do it. Um, now, some observations, again, subject to uh, question. People need a, com a functioning community for, filling to f or for a fulfilling life. I have a whole discussion on how that developed out of the Neolithic village, but I won't do that now. And a community can be defined as a group of people who communicate on a regular basis. Now, I'm going to introduce the term agora, which is not a new term. It's Greek. It's the sort of the field where everybody hung out during the day, and the name uh, it derives from agon, the, uh, the, the pain that the wrestlers felt when they were, con they were contending with each other. So in general, the agora is the place where information exchange occurs in public. This is very important. And people gain knowledge of who the other people are. So they become no longer isolated individuals. And this is where community forms. So that has been, we, we can see that in every community from antiquity. And then the interesting question is how that developed. I mean, this is, uh, let's say that in, in the Neolithic vill village, uh, civilization developed there, but it, not in the houses. It developed in the space between the houses, and that became the agora. Uh, so you find village squares, the Roman forums, Renaissance Piazza, the plain of the uh, Netherlands. Ev it's everywhere. And 
through cultural evolution, which occurs on a much more rapid basis than biological evolution, the need for the agora is built into every one of us. So that's a, that's a, something I'll posit, and I can't claim to have proved it. Um, the agora is a commons of information. In effect, I'm creating a kind of a definition here. And like all commas, it can be captured and exploited and enclosed. The agricultural commons of the England and so forth were subject to that, and that was the beginning of capitalism. And uh, it happened to the agora. First of all, literacy, print. People could write stuff down, read it to others, read it to themselves. You had to pay something for that. So it's beginning to be privatized. And it's gone all the way to the fact that the, our agora these days is the mass media, which is a broadcast phenomenon. An agora that I've been talking about is non-broadcast. And therein lies the rub. There's where the, the change has to be made. So we, they set up the first social media system. There was a resource one. And it opened in 1973. Uh, we have had, with the help of hackers like Richard Greenblatt, uh, we developed an information retrieval system that was not tied to a predetermined set of uh, indexing words. You could create your own index word. You just enter it. The machine took care of the bookkeeping. And we set up terminals uh, technically without preloading them with data. Now, we did a little work to do that, admittedly. We, it was not, it was complete zero. But otherwise, beyond that, all the media, all the, the content, this magical stuff called content, was provided by the users themselves. We did not advertise it. We simply set it up in a few places that people frequented. We had to choose the place fairly carefully, and when we moved it, other people would use it, and the people wouldn't follow it. We found, discovered that out. But it was successful because people did use it, and Whereas we had assumed that there would only be a few categories like jobs, housing, and cars, in part because the paper bulletin boards of the university were divided into those areas, that supposition went out the window. It was a, a tremendous range of things, which included a learning exchange dialogue. And one can look at the uh, writings of Ivan Illich, I-L-L-I-C-H, I may mention that here, um, who was important to me, but he had written a whole book about de-schooling society in 1970 or 71, and he, at the end of it, he said, well, what can we have instead of schools? Well, maybe computers can be used to connect people who know things with people who want to learn them, right? And some of our people had seeded an item into the database saying, where can we find good bagels in the Bay Area? Now, I must explain here, a bagel is a toroidal roll, baked roll. I think it's a Chinese invention, I'm not sure. Um, and it became a, a Jewish uh, specialty, which is mostly on the East Coast, and you couldn't get many, you know, there weren't many places to get them in San Francisco. So two answers came in, here, here you can buy them, literally. And the third answer was the winner. And it said, if you call this phone number and ask for this name, a former bagel maker will teach you how to, yes, okay, thank you, will teach you how to make ba bagels. We never found out if they actually did. So I like to say that we opened the door to cyberspace and found that it was hospitable territory. And the personal computer flowed out of this. We needed to have terminals that would work in public. There I was, the hardware engineer, I didn't know much software. And I began an investigation. And uh, 
what came of this was preparation for the arrival of the personal computer in 1975. We also had social media developing elsewhere, the bulletin board systems using telephones. I'm gonna skip through this and uh, the usual commercial networks. Now, each of these examples, so I can be asked legitimately, how much money did you make at this? And the answer is we didn't make any money, it cost us money. Uh, for those who went in the direction of uh, something that made income, as soon as they could get some money going, they stopped development. We were there to continue that development. And we can see today that social media has generated a number of problems, this tribalization, silos, siloization of discourse, distortion of the polity. I mean, we're living this in the U.S. right now. And a distraction. So, just one point, we can, the, the technical model for how information is stored in most social media systems is the papyrus scroll not any more advanced than the Egyptians. Uh, and I could, I'll discuss that privately uh, with anyone as to why that is. So we need to be able to plan an alternative direction and we need to work out how to manage the commons of information. And every commons must be, have management and it develops organically if the commons is to survive. There are people around who write books saying, oh, there's a tragedy of the commons because everybody will be greedy and go for their maximum self-interest. No, no, that's Adam Smith talking. That's not the historical commons, like fisheries, agricultural commons. Each of those had processes for self-management. We need to invent this processes for self-management for the commons of information. And one thing that I, didn't have the word for. I, I, I think, thought we, well, we had to have something called the inspectorate. And these are people who are entire, empowered to investigate, but not empowered to uh, do anything about it. And it was finally a, a professor named Porkson in Germany, writing a book, Digital Fever, who contacted me and asked me to, to write an introduction. He says, this is journalism. That's what we were missing. And he's right. So we need journalism. Now, I suggest a model of public parks. If people say, well, how's it gonna pay for itself? How do public parks pay for itself? They don't. And they serve many of the functions of the agora. And I have been saying for years that the, the natural custodians of the commons of information are librarians, or at least people educated that way. And uh, there's the in Internet Engineering Task Force, which has been working for decades on a voluntary basis to keep the internet working where there has been constant attempts to take them over by different private concerns, which are all rejected by the members because it's workers' power. These are the engineers who do the work. They're gonna not let somebody tell them what to do. And I think we're there, I think we're at the end. Well, so I'm, going to be trying to continue my work because people are now asking me, aren't you sorry? I'm not sorry. We have much more work to do and I think we can chart a course this way, which is not the course that's going for what we call social media today. They'll do their own thing. I'm not interested in stopping them. We couldn't stop them, but we have to provide the structures, the culture, and the practices of self-management of our commons of information. And I can help, and I think you can too. Thank you. Thank you. 
为我们带来怎样的一些成果。然后，请大家再次以热烈的掌声，对菲尔斯坦先生的发言表示感谢。谢谢。那么接下来就是我们的问答时间，然后我们第一个问题的时间还是先留给场上的嘉宾。呃，请问场上的嘉宾有没有什么想要问菲尔森斯坦先生的 ？I'm not a professor, I'm an engineer. Presentation and all the engaging stories. So, um, so I'm wondering, um, you know, out of things that you see, you know, that that exist right now, um. Uh, what comes closest to the uh, yeah, to the type of to the type of system or, or institution that you're envisioning, right? Yeah, so so when mm -hmm. when when you talked about librarians as information mediators or a commons of information that serves as a public space uh, um, uh, where one could meet others, um, uh, may I immediately thought of a public library? Right? Um, I was also thinking about scientific literature and how that operates. Um, uh, well, yeah. So uh, so I, I'm wondering if there particular institutions or systems, uh, online or offline, that to you right now seem like the closest thing to an ideal model? I don't think I'm uh, sufficiently informed to give a good answer to that question. Because I haven't made, I, I have not be, uh, become a media critic yet. I criticize media, yes, but I am still trying to build stuff. and so. It helps if you don't know too much about the competition, <laughs> or they might scare you away. Um, so I don't have a, a good answer for what's closest, but I invite everybody to try to find the answer themselves to that, that works for them and discuss it. That would be the most productive outcome. So I can't, I can't give you a, a definitive answer. It's this, this, and not that. No, I'm sorry. Do you have another question? Oh, we have a hand up. No, no, yeah, that's it. Who was? Whoever. I thought the woman next to you was holding your hand, but maybe not. Um, thank you for um, what you have sh shared. And um, my question was, Maybe, like you said, it's a, it should be a question for myself to think further on, but I was wondering about your, um, in a skilled set um, way. Um, I have been wondering if today for our immediate realities, for example, the Chinese society, I understand the social structure is different from a structure um, you have lived through or provided um, as a different social structure where, for example, if organizing things in a public park today as the alternative is easier or but a bit different from what we can do here. Um, and also, I have been thinking about if we, we wanted to create a new social media structure today, it would be like we have to move people from, for example, WeChat migrate these users to a new structure. And that wasn't the case for the 1960s where there weren't that structure to begin with. So I don't know if you have any thoughts on, uh, like, te I, I guess tech technical, um, I don't know, expertise on building tools in a different structure or, because um, okay. I maybe I lack the technical, knowledge on if there's any um, different networks we could use, for example, like right. Bluetooth or I don't know. Uh, so I, I <clears throat> maybe I'm a strange phenomenon here, but I know a lot about the past and I'm trying to do the future, but I don't really know that much about the present. <laughs> um, first of all, the, the, the public parks is a metaphor. I'm talking about using the same organizational concepts, and uh, they, they have provided answers in, to a lot of objections that would be brought up. I'm not saying we do it literally in the public parks, so let's be clear about that. Um, and I'm aware that Chinese society is much different than 
Western society and beware of the fact that I've only researched in Western society and Middle Eastern society that much. You know, most of my education comes from absorbing things in my time in Berkeley, which was actually 29 years because I lived there and ran a business. Uh, so a lot of research has to be done into anthropology and in fact I understand there's a great uh, museum here and I very much look forward to visiting it to, to begin my education in Chinese uh, cultural history. Um, the the uh, I, one thing I do have experience with is the process of development of, of unexpected things, and it takes a certain narrowness of vision. So you don't, if you learn everything about everything, you know all the ways to do it wrong. So you, you limit them with the breadth of, of the things you learn, you have to study, and you move forward on the basis of, of vision. You can't prove you're right, but you have this vision, and the best thing you do is to implement and test, implement experience and analyze. That's just the dialectical process. Um, so, again, I, I, anyone coming to me for the, the, the book on how to do it, well, I, have a, I will have a book coming out, maybe in a year. I've written it. And it goes into great detail about what I've been saying and more. And I hope that people will not just read it as an, an interesting artifact and say, look at this crazy guy, uh, but rather say, this, I, what I saw right there in that part of it got me thinking about something. That's, that would be the best outcome. Um, I don't have any better advice than that. Um, you know, get my book, right? Okay. <laughs> we will try to do a Chinese edition. I'll talk to my publisher about that. Um, but I think I'd probably need to check with some of you about how that reads. You know, it, it, uh, anyway. So um, I wish you all luck. Let's say <laughs> I'll be. I'm counting on being around for up to 15 years if I'm lucky. But then. The Lee Felsenstein of 15 years from now won't be much like now. <laughs> I'll probably be nothing but a, a, a self-appointed oracle ready to tell everybody how to do anything and to whom nobody should listen. So, and, but in the meantime, I, I do expect to be able to produce some kind of artifact, some kind of new version of community memory w based on what, not just what I've learned, that's not the important part. It's what everyone contributes. And so that's all we can, that's what I want to look forward to. Did you, Rodrigo? Oh, I was, Mark. I was just, um, you talked about the scrolling and the papyrus scrolls that we've come back to that. I was just curious if you wanted to say a little more about that. Well. Every computer the, from the first ones has to have some editing capability. And you have to have a, a chunk of information and it's a file. And you are always able to append things at the end of the file and grow it downwards like a scroll. And that is where m most of the social media systems we know about began and ended their development. However, with community memory, we treated it more like a book. And it had an index. And the fun part was that the readers could create the index and index their items and so forth. We, uh, we improved that through three generations of development into a dual data structure whereby you could append your item, you, you could uh, not append, you could attach, you'd link your item using hyperlinks in effect to another item or you could add index words or any reader could add index words so that they showed up in a different place. Um, and the, uh, well, we hardly got to start that in operation. It only ran for two years. That's where I'm going to start on the next one. So computers are capable. They can do things 
that we can't. Otherwise, if we currently, if you're going to look in Craigslist, in theory, you go to a se section and you start reading the entire bloody scroll of entries. Now that's so long that these days you just can only do one day's worth. And so every time you place an item onto Craigslist, you have to go back and enter it again to keep it alive. And so you have this huge scroll developing that no one will ever read. And then we have the Slack and Discords, which are made for gamers, for over-caffeinated teenagers who just want to have a place they can write something and see it, so people can see it, and it just scrolls out to an infinity and never gets seen again. So you see, it has, the structure has its uses built into it. So we're more interested in having indexes and be able to create conversations. I and mean, that's really the, the unit of, the, uh, of social media as I see it. Uh, and in fact, I, we're going to, I hope, try an experiment soon here where we allow people to do this in, in physical space and record the results. And I certainly hope that I am not proven wrong. <laughs> but um, if I do, I'll, I'll work from there. Okay. We thank you for your wonderful answer. With that, we will then move on to our next question. From our Slido question, here we have a really rather lengthy question. He says that in the movement in the 1960s, we found that even for students majoring in social science or with a technical and engineering background, they are very strong in taking initiatives. And they are very motivated in taking initiatives. And you can see that there are changes in mindset. There are also the change of mindset that leads to strong actions. But however, nowadays you are seeing those students majoring in the technical and engineering background are losing their motive in taking actions. And how about students majoring in social science be motivated to learn more about the technical background so as to promote their own studies? The best thing I can suggest is uh, conversation among the various, shall we call them tribes? I don't know, I don't like that. But, um, but uh, and in fact, social media could, could, could facilitate that. But nonetheless, the important conversation is in the individual discussion. Uh, I suppose that the big question in the room is always, how can I make a lot of money in this? And we can start from the standpoint of, you won't make a big, large amount of money on this medium, but people can expand their opportunities in the world through it, and you can too. So it's a matter of, I mean, there is a, there is a joke from long ago on the radio. Someone says that they're getting a, a central heating installed in their house. So they're putting the radiators outside. Why is that, says the straight man. And he says, well, if the outside's warm, the inside's warm. And so that should be the mindset. We want to make the outside warm so the inside can be warm. Um, and this is a, presents a sort of cultural problem you know, to get this in information through people's heads. I don't know how you do that, but I see it. But discussion and conversation, especially at a one-to-one -one, uh, level, is what's going to be needed. So you need to create forums where these conversations can happen. I'm sorry I can't be more detailed about that. I mean, whenever I'm presented with a problem, I'm supposed to generate a plan. That's what engineers do, and I don't have a plan for this. But, uh, but you can do that too, okay? So is there more? Oh. <laughs> 好的, 我们看到slido上还有一个问题是关于我们最近一种比较新型的社交媒体网络 我就, 
就是社交媒体的那种商业性的问题嘛。So the, the, the English version is, do you think today's federated social media such as Mastodon can solve the social media as business problem? Thank you. Well, first of all, I don't know about Mastodon. I've just heard it, I've named it. So I can't answer, give you an informed answer. Um, will something that has been developed for one purpose work for another purpose? Maybe, if you're lucky. But you will probably have to use it in a different way. And that's where the, the that's cultural um, transformation. That's how it works. They didn't intend it to be used that way, but everybody's using it that way. And so either they follow along or, or just be happy that they're making money. But uh, that direction is not something that is preordained. So Mastodon has some purpose. I don't even know what it is. Uh, and its usership will have to make its purpose into their purpose, not the other way around. Uh, and they will have to develop uh, practices, uh, myths, literature, and uh, be able to talk among themselves in that language that describes what they're doing, using words and terminology that haven't been used before. Um, cultural appropriation, I think that's a word for it. It's time we did some cultural appropriation, hey? Eh? So uh, I, I can't answer the, it directly to Mastodon per se, but in general, that's what's gonna be needed. 好的，那么我们今天的问答时间到此就告一段落了。非常感谢，呃，费尔森斯坦为我们带来的精彩演讲，以及对于几个问题非常认真的、细致的解答。那么在此以热烈掌声欢迎费尔森斯坦，也希望未来我们能有更多的机会与您进行交流。谢谢。Thank you.